Welcome to Wind Down Wednesday. Here are your hosts, Jeffrey Tobias Halter and Amanda Hammett. Good afternoon. Today we are focusing on the intersection of environmental, social, and governance, otherwise known as ESG. And we're going to do that through our lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion in corporate America. My name is Amanda Hammett. And today, because I was feeling fancy, I took my regular, you know, raspberry hibiscus kombucha and I put it into a lovely wine glass that Jeff would be proud of. <laughs> so Jeffrey, what are you here I thought you were really stepping out. It looked like a cordial or something. So, uh, you know, nice chilly fall day. I'm actually enjoying a uh, South African red from the Stalinbosch region, one of uh, the best little wine countries that not a lot of people know about. So uh, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful color and it smells good and I'm going to enjoy it while I talk to an old friend. Um, it is my absolute honor to introduce Allie Hartman, uh, a, a lifelong advocate and change maker. Allie has spent her professional career in roles that sit at the intersection of profit and purpose. She is an expert in responsible investment, ESG integration, and venture philanthropy. She is also very passionate about advancing women. She believes that to unlock the most change, we must build bridges between power and perspective. Well, Allie, welcome to Wine Down Wednesday. So before we get into all of this really cool stuff that we're going to talk about today, you got to share, what are you, what are you drinking today? <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that. Not only, uh, wonderfully inspiring introduction, but just very warm introduction, Jeff. Appreciate it. I um it's also chilly where I am and um my kids are fighting a cold. So I'm drinking a um mushroom chocolate uh like warm beverage from a local oh. uh, maker where I am. So I'm really excited about that. It's delicious. Wow, Love that, that sounds yummy. Yeah. So, well, and Elliot. And indulgence. You got a little bit of both. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Well, it's been a while since we've talked, and uh, for our listeners, I want to share this. I've uh, I've known Allie for a long time, even though she is uh, so young uh, and so well accomplished. Uh, we met at the Coca Cola Company, no great surprise, at a women's resource group event, and uh, I believe she was a manager in the public affairs group. And within five minutes of talking to her, you knew this woman was just going to be amazing that she would either be an SVP at the Coca-Cola company or someplace else. Uh, we share a lot of very similar views around allyship and advancing women. And so, uh, Allie, would you just spend a few minutes and, and talk about the highlights of your career? And you've got some really interesting upfront parts that if you have time to, to share those shortly around where you went from and how you got here. Yeah, sure. Um, I remember, I remember that, that first meeting and I would say I was as enamored and taken with you as you with me. I think it's not, it's not all that common though. You're working to make it more common to see men and, and male allies in those spaces and to have, you know, such a conviction in that moment was really, really exciting and inspiring. Um, my background to jump into that. So I am probably the last person that many people <laughs> I grew up with um, would ever guess to sit in the roles that I have, right? So I grew up, I'm the daughter of social justice activists. Both of my parents have been in prison multiple times for their activism. And I um, thought that I was going to go and change the world in, in similar ways to what the adults in my life were doing, right? Being on the outside of systems and agitating and activating uh, for change that, that I believed in. Um, I spent the first 20 three years of my life working in the public sector and nonprofits, activist organizations, academic um, spaces, and thinking about the opportunities to create change at scale. I was a women and gender studies major in college and have always centered women. Women are sort of this visible and sometimes invisible thread and theme throughout my life and my work and um, what I most believe in from a theory of change perspective. So I've been in that gender space for a while. It was in graduate school that I took a class. I was in, in graduate school in France and didn't want to take any more classes in French because my brain was exhausted. <laughs> so <laughs> I looked for any class I could find. I was studying international affairs, any class I could find that would qualify. Um, and there was a class called business ethics. And so I begrudgingly took that class, uh, which also for 
to be fair, felt like a foreign language. And lo and behold, it completely changed my life. It was about a month into class that I had this light bulb moment where I realized companies had more power, more flexibility, more access, more connectivity than most governments or nonprofits would ever hope to have. And then if I wanted to be a change maker in a real and sustainable and scaled way, that at the very, very least, I had to learn how to work with and within companies. And I had no role models for that or innate skills, you know, to, to do that. And so I realized like I knew what I didn't know. And I made a deal with myself that after I graduated, I would go and try to find that job um, mm-hmm. in the private sector that hopefully had some purpose elements to it, but that would allow me to get the experience and credibility and access that I felt like I needed. Well, it's been a lot, even though you thank you for the compliment of, of me um, being young, but it's been 15 years, not two. <laughs> yeah. and I have stayed in the private sector um, because I found that I'm actually really good at translating and moving between the outside external pressures of the world and the inside workings and strategy of a company. And that I can move really fluidly and fluently between those two spaces. And as you said in my intro, you know, build the bridges between power and perspective. I think so, so often in our world, public, private, in between, the people who have, who are proximate to the issue, who understand it, who have lived it, don't have the resources or the authority to to affect change and vice versa. People who have resources and authority don't always have that perspective to create change that is needed and and meaningful and lasting, right? And so my my job I see as being a bridge builder between those spaces. Allie, and what a perfect person you are to be in that role. I mean, just kind of the the experience that you had, you know, obviously with your parents growing up and, and that kind of activism and then being able to move into this space where you're creating activism internally for corporations. I mean, that is that is amazing. That is amazing. So let's let's take a second. And I'd love to hear more about why corporate responsibility is so important. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say that um, while, while I wasn't there, uh, you know, when, when man first found fire, right? like, I wasn't there when companies <laughs> first found CSR, but I was there pretty early on, um, you know, certainly in, in the evolution of this moment in time we find ourselves in. And I think it's super interesting to look at the role that you know, and and by the way, quick side note, it is alphabet soup out there, right? You've got ESG and CSR and RI and SRI and, you know, um, impact and citizenship and philanthropy and, you know, all these different terms and like what means what. So when I, when I say corporate responsibility and sustainability, I mean how a company is thinking about their operations, right? And, and, and their material issues to their business. When I think about ESG, it's, it is corporate responsibility and sustainability, but it's from a the perspective of um, my seat in you know big investment firms where we have many companies in our portfolio, and we're really looking at what are the environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities that companies have. Some of them are universal, or, or there's a lot of commonality. Others are unique, and they're bespoke to that individual company. Um, I think why this is important is because. The world is a very different place than even 15 years ago, but certainly than 30 years ago, right? When we think about Mm -hmm. capitalism and business in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, it's a completely different world than we are right now. And certainly than where I think we're headed in the next 10, 15, 25 years. Mm -hmm. Um, And I actually see CSR and ESG as a bridge between an old way of doing business and a new way of doing business. We haven't arrived at the new way of doing business yet, but I I think we're headed there. I'm happy to talk about that more in a minute. Why the world is different, there's so much more complexity. There's so much more constraint on the system, right? Jeff mentioned us working at Coca-Cola. You know, whether Coca-Cola or or, or any other number of beverage or food, you know, um, companies, the inputs were the inputs might have been the same, but the cost of getting them and the availability of them are totally different than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? When water flowed like wine, 
good, good joke for this podcast. Um, <laughs> when water flowed like wine and it was readily, readily available and really cheap, companies didn't have to think about how much they used, right? That's a very mm-hmm. tactical example. Now, as we have these floods and droughts, we have water quality and quantity issues, you know, something as, as basic as water that is an input into not only every human body, but into countless products, you know, and services that are created and help make the world go around from an economic standpoint. If water is unavailable or of poor quality, or you have an inefficient system, you can't do business, right? And that's just one example. You can look at that from a talent and labor perspective, right? Labor trends have changed, not just in who's ready and skilled and available to work, but also in terms of the transparency and governance and regulations around what work is or isn't, right? So the world has changed so fundamentally. And because of that, I think that there's an incredibly important reality for companies that want to not just survive, but thrive in this new moment, new norm, right? Where you have complexity and you have constraints to your business model, your core business that you just didn't have even a decade ago. And those are only going to get more intense, right? We say like the world's never going to get less complex than it is right now. (laughs) Um, And so I think that this is this work is about viability. It's not about morality, right? It's about how can we create systems that are healthy and thriving and being of service, both in their core operations, but also in how they see themselves in an increasingly complex world. Wow. That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> especially <laughs> just, for our just a little. A little yeah, just a little bit. Um, so I want to bring this down just a little bit and really talk about what individuals can do. But but I want to preface individuals with, you know, our listeners are everybody from an SVP, maybe running a division to an individual contributor. And it's, you know, as a, as a career leader, many times it was easy to say, well, you know what, that that's a corporate thing that doesn't impact me. Or, you know, if I'm an individual contributor, what, what can I do? And so how can uh, you influence individuals to to make changes in this area? Just one or two examples. The only meaningful change that has ever happened in our world has happened because individuals acted, right? Like we need people, we need all of us to do a little bit more where we are with what we have, right? This is not saying that you have to go out and totally reinvent yourself. Though if you want to do that, great, go do it, right? This is saying that you have such immense opportunity, responsibility, access, and power if you're inside these systems that you really need to think about the power of compound change, right? And the ability to take small steps. A lot of times we want like revolution, but evolution is really what leads to change at scale and meaningful change, right? A lot of times revolution creates a creates a lot of energy, but there's often a reversion back to the thing before the revolution, right? Or that we don't really evolve out of that reality. And so I think sometimes we the, the problems that we're facing inside of companies and certainly in the world can feel overwhelming and insurmountable. And, and I, I totally get that. I also think it's really important for us to find the problems that can be solved to figure out and map a way to solve them and then to stick with it until we do. And we don't have to take the elephant, right? We can take the piece that we know we can solve. I'd also flag that like one of the most important things, I think a lot of times people think of my work as like rainbows and unicorns, right? It's like, oh, you do this like really like special, like touchy feel like, oh, it's so nice to be you, right? And I appreciate that, uh, but I will guarantee <laughs> that my work and a lot of your listeners' work is very far from rainbows and unicorns, right? We mm-hmm. are in the trenches thinking about issues that are really complex, that have trade-offs. And yes, maybe there is some, this is the right thing to do. But every time I go and talk to a CEO, mine or others, I am coming in armed with the data of this is the smart thing to do, right? I think rooting yourself in evidence and in data Uh, both qualitative and quantitative, having the numbers, having the analysis, having the backup, knowing why this thing is going to create value or reduce risk for your company. Like not just like, oh, I think we should do this because it makes me feel good and it makes other people feel good. But like, I think we should do this because our retention numbers are decreasing year over year. We know that people crave purpose. We believe that this will give them that. We've heard, you know, like you you need to go in with that business case. Um, And so I think that's one of the most, one of the reasons I've been successful 
is that I, I'm always rooted. I try to be inspirational and aspirational, but I'm always rooted in evidence and data. Very good. So Ali, let me ask you this. Um, you recently talked about in an interview, you, you mentioned putting your attention toward your intention. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that break that down for us? Um, yeah, I mean, so for me, when I when I say that, I think uh, in my life and in certainly my my professional uh, experience of the last decade and a half, a lot of times you see individuals, organizations who have really great intention, who want to do something, who see a vision for something, right? But intention without action, without attention, without tending to that is pretty much useless, right? You can, you can say, I want to, um, I want to take off the year and travel the world. But if you never like talk to your job about that, book your plane tickets, build an itinerary, mm-hmm. save your money, right? You're, you're not putting attention towards that, right? right? Similarly, I think a lot of times we have activity, we have momentum, we have things that are happening, right? Companies and, and people's lives, they move quickly. And so you'll do things, But if you're doing them without a purpose and without a vision, without a strategy, then they're kind of reactive and ad hoc and they don't often amount to what they could have been if you had that sense, right? You're like, there's an opportunity to combine both of those things, I think, when when we're talking about change in any forum um, and make sure that, you know, you, you have you have a reality where your intention is stated and clear and then you do the work to back that up. And, and you might not reach what you thought you would, right? That's, I think a lot of times, Jeff, you and I have talked about this. A lot of times people are really afraid to state intentions because they're afraid of failing, right? Especially in the diversity space. It's like, well, I don't want to say we want to reach this milestone or this number or this, because like, what if we don't do it? What if we can't get there? And so a lot of times, therefore, you just start, you're like, oh, well, we'll just have some affinity groups and we'll just talk to these recruiters and we'll just do this thing over here and we'll do all this attention work. We'll do all these day-to-day tasks. And, and actions, but without that North Star, you're never going to achieve all that you can achieve, right? And similarly, you have in this moment in time, so many companies making grand proclamations about their commitment to women or to racial justice or to the LGBTQIA community, but like public commitments are nothing <laughs> without the tactics and and the on the ground things that are actually going to move you towards them. So in this work and in my life in general, I think it's really important for me to to understand where a company wants to go or understand where I want to go and then really figure out the things that it's going to take. Wow. What a great show. And for all our listeners, I want you to know this is just a teaser. This is such a big topic. We are going to tell you we're already bringing Allie back on our next show to go much deeper on this topic. And so get ready to tune back in. We're going to continue this amazing conversation. Allie, we want to thank you for sharing your amazing thoughts on corporate social responsibility and what people can do. We're going to have you back immediately, literally next week (laughs) to go much deeper. And so for our listeners, please join us next week for this session. But Allie, thank you very much. And as we say on Wind Down Wednesday, uh, cheers. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again for joining us for Wind Down Wednesdays, a contemporary midweek discussion on current workplace and marketplace issues with a focus on diversity, inclusion, intersectionality, and equality. I'm Amanda Hammett. And on behalf of myself and Jeffrey Tobias Halter, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for joining us for Wind Down Wednesday. If you like this episode, please subscribe to receive more episodes straight to your inbox.